Welcome to Wind Down Wednesday. Here are your hosts, Jeffrey Tobias Halter and Amanda Hammett. Well, good afternoon. I'm Jeffrey Tobias Halter, and I'm excited to bring back diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist Lily Zhang to talk more about their work and their book, DEI Deconstructed, The State of DEI. And we always rattle that off too fast. It's actually in their book, and we talk about that. But today, I want to welcome you. I am uh, drinking. It's a cold day in Atlanta, so a little coffee, a little Baileys. Amanda, what's your beverage of choice? Uh, also on the coffee train, I'm drinking uh, an oat milk latte today to keep myself warm. Um, but yes, yes, let's let's dive in today. I am I'm very excited and I'm honored to welcome back Lily Zhang. Um, coming back to Wind Down Wednesday for episode number two. Um, they are a no nonsense diversity, equity, and inclusion speaker, strategist, and consultant who specializes in creating diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces through hands on systemic change. Uh, a dedicated change maker and advocate that was named Forbes DNI Trailblazer, a 2021 DEI influencer, and LinkedIn top voice on racial equity. Lily's work's been featured in the Harvard Business Review, recently had a great uh, article that came out, as well as the New York Times and NPR. Lily, welcome back to Wind Down Wednesday. What's your beverage of choice today? Hey, it's great to be back. I am once again drinking my favorite beverage, uh, jasmine green tea, which I will drink pretty much every day until I die. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) All right, Lily, for those of us who or those that miss the earlier episode, um, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to that. But for those, those that did miss it, why don't you share just a brief overview of your work and your new book? Sure. So I'm a DEI strategist. And what that means without the jargon is I go into companies and I help them actually succeed in their DEI initiatives. So if they say they want diversity, I help them achieve it. If they say they want equity, I help them achieve that. If they say they want inclusion, I help them build an inclusive workplace. And part and parcel to all my work is not just focusing on the effort that goes into trying to make these things succeed, uh, but succeeding, actually creating the outcomes that we set out to achieve. So, you know, I'm I'm very excited to talk more about that with all all y'all today, but um, the book really centers on exactly just that, how it is we turn our intentions to do good into not just action, not just impact, but measurable outcomes that benefit everyone, especially the marginalized groups who are disadvantaged and uh, disenfranchised by our current systems, our current organizations and societies. So how do we go about even starting this conversation around social identities, such as race, gender, sexuality, ability, ableness, and so on at work, quite frankly, without getting stuck? Because it can feel really tough sometimes. Yeah. So (laughs) I have an entire chapter dedicated to this. And the impetus for that chapter was Mm -hmm. exactly what you mentioned. Everyone gets stuck. People don't feel comfortable talking about identity. People feel like it's a minefield. Um, And what I hear most from my clients is they're worried that they'll say the wrong thing and the world will end. And that's something that I hear time and time again, every day doing this work. So like, like you said, how can we get stuck? It starts by recognizing that identity, all this conversation of identity, of race, of gender, sexuality, ability, religion, so on and so forth. These are all languages. These are all things that we can become more comfortable talking about. These are things we can build proficiency in, but it takes practice and it takes the willingness to, like learning a new language, being awful at it for a little bit. One of the things I talk about in the chapter is especially in the DEI space, we can be guilty sometimes of really embracing the identity conversation for some groups, but not necessarily all of them. And so here's the here's the weird paradox of talking about privilege specifically and identity. One, being a member of a privileged group means you actually have the privilege of not needing to talk about that identity very often. So that's a privilege, but it's also 
uh, a pretty big shortcoming because if you don't have to talk about that identity very often, then you don't get very good at it because you haven't had to do it before. And so just as an example, right? If I go up to someone and say, hey, you're white, immediately, right? Like there's that sort of like, and what? And what? The penny's going to drop. Something bad's going to happen. Oh, God, right? Or I go up to someone and say, hey, you're a man. And it's like, oh, no, right? Like something horrible is about to happen because you only bring up my identity when, when I've done something wrong. When things are good, I'm not a man. I'm Jeffrey, right? Like when something's good, like I'm not white. I'm just Amanda, right? Like when, but when there's a critique, suddenly it's like, now we're going to talk about how you're cisgender, heterosexual, white, non-disabled, like all of these things. And that's a big problem because it means that we don't build the comfort, the, the ability to talk fluently using identity terms in non-charged contexts so that when we end up having these conversations in potentially charged contexts, people react with defensiveness. Because they've never had these conversations before. They hate they're they're not used to it. And now for the first time, their identities are being named and it's as part of a critique. So people freeze up, people lock up, they they're scared, they don't know what's going on, they're not comfortable, they're not familiar. Um, and so they lash out and then things get worse from there. So how we evolve from you know getting stuck really requires that we become more comfortable talking about our identities, including our privileged ones, in neutral terms right? Like, for example, I have lots of marginalized identities. I'm very used to talking about all of those. But I grew up upper class, right? Like, that's a very privileged identity. And here's the thing about class, right? Like, you don't really talk about it much. It's not a thing that you talk about, like all privileged identities, right? And how am I supposed to ever interrogate class if I never bring it up until someone critiques me about it? I'm not. Like, how is anyone with privileged identity supposed to, to reckon with that until they get some experience talking about it? And this is how we get unstuck. We build comfort, we build experience talking about not only our marginalized identities, but our privileged identities in neutral terms, casually, comfortably, so that when those critiques happen, we can center ourselves and engage with the sort of presence of mind, with the calmness, with the emotional regulation that that deserves. I love that. I love I love the way that you talk about that, um, and you're a hundred a hundred percent correct. Um, so let me ask you this, Lily what What do employees, customers, and other stakeholders expect out of their corporate leaders these days? A lot, <laughs> and a lot more than they used to. That's for sure. Um, especially when we look at younger generations like millennials and Gen Z that are not only expecting mm -hmm. corporations to, I don't know, pay them, but are increasingly expecting corporations to provide safe, inclusive workplaces for corporations to, you know, understand their varied living circumstances and to provide support for their mental health, their physical health, their benefits, right? Like all of these things. The expectation on employers have never been higher. And for good reason, because in society, the burden on individual people, especially on marginalized groups, has also never been higher. People are looking to corporations to fill the gap that honestly uh, has been left behind by, maybe this is a spicy take, by governments, right? Like, yeah. not necessarily stepping in in the way that they had 50, 60 years ago. And so people are increasingly saying, look, you know, my company is the one thing that decides if I live or die, right? Like, unless I get health benefits through my company, I'm toast. Unless I get, you know, paid a living wage through my company, I'm toast. I can't rely on safety nets anymore. And so all of this, plus the increasing pressure on companies by millennials and Gen Z in particular to get it right on social issues means that modern day leaders are expected to not only manage the work, but connect with people, but to really meet the needs of their teams, their departments, to create inclusive cultures, to be mentors, to be coaches, to help people, you know, proceed in their careers and grow and develop, um, to help hold people accountable, to help upskill people to be the best versions of themselves. Um, and man, and they're not getting paid anymore to do, you know, those 20 extra things. They're also not getting training on how to do those 20 extra things. And so I, I really feel for leaders right now. I feel for managers. The expectations are mounting, but the resources that they have haven't changed. And so what we see are 
thousands, tens of thousands of people, you know, flailing around in the dark, recognizing that they need to be better, but not knowing how and not knowing in what ways and not knowing what they need to end up as. It's tough. It's really tough right now. So, Lily, you, um, you've got senior leaders who want to do this work. And we're, we're just for the sake of the podcast, what <clears throat> one or two actions do you want senior leaders to take right now? Talk to the folks who report to you, or if you're a senior leader, do some skip level conversations. Talk to folks who are more junior um, and ask them about their experiences. By the way, not just their experiences, but ask them to diagnose what is working and what is not inside your own organization. So if you can just ask one question, just say, hey, (laughs) I'm really committed to making this organization better. And that requires knowing what we're already doing well and what we're not doing well. So if you could be CEO for a day, what is the one biggest thing that you could fix to make the biggest impact on your experience as an employee? Ask that. Just that one question, right? That's true. Or, or hell, like design a survey with like 10 questions, right? But <laughs> understand that experience at the very bottom. Understand that experience for as many different groups as possible and use the data you gather to design better. Because here, here's the problem with, with, uh, with, with execs. No one wants to tell you bad news. Like this is just the the secret that comes, right? The higher you get in the org, the less people want to actually talk to you about what they're actually experiencing. It's horrible. It's really stressful. So any little smidge of data you can get about people's actual experiences is enormously valuable. Collect that any way you can. And that that will really help you make better decisions as a leader. All right. I, I think that that was a great answer. I think it was something that was really easily, you know, something that someone could do today. But let me ask you this. Let's say we have somebody who is not a senior leader. Mm-hmm. What what could they do if they want to make some impact on DEI outcomes? Yeah, well, most people aren't senior leaders. So uh, as you might imagine, I get asked this question a lot. And right? my, my answer is triage. So in the same way that senior leaders have no access to information, right? They they don't really know what's wrong. If you're not a senior leader, you actually probably know quite a bit about what's wrong because you experience it. You see it every day. And if you don't see it, your colleagues probably do. Now, here's the thing you don't have insight into. It's harder for people who aren't senior leaders to understand the inner workings, the machinations of corporations. It's hard to understand how systems work. And so when you have a negative experience or your colleague has a negative experience, the single most powerful thing you can do is to answer the question, why? Why did this happen? What are the mechanisms by which this happened? What processes, policies, structures, people, practices, culture went into this bad outcome happening? And if you can trace it back to that, then one step forward, what would need to happen for policies, processes, strategy, people, culture to change that outcome into a better one? And talk with your colleagues, talk with your peers, ask them the same question. How can we design for a better organization where these bad outcomes don't happen? And once you have that solution and a group of people that agree on that solution, here's a secret. You've just started a small movement. You've just started a small collective effort to make things better. You've diagnosed the problem. You've created a solution. Now, all you need to do is to communicate with senior leaders to create a pathway to change, to get more people to sign on to the cause, right? And this is, I mean, you know, this is organizational change in its most basic grassroots form. Um, And anyone can do it. You don't need to be a consultant. You don't need to have a leadership title. You can just do that. And it starts with triage. Wow. Well, Lily, thank you so much for this series of interviews for our listeners. If you missed the first episode, really encourage you to go back and listen to that one. This is the start of a conversation. And it's really built around the amazing work that Lily has done in their book, DEI Deconstructed. I've done this work for 20 years. This book is groundbreaking, and it's a must read for everyone in the organization. So on behalf of Amanda and I, thank you very much for our listeners. Lily, thank you for joining us for this series of interviews. We appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. And this is just a conversation starter. Please go out and buy DEI Deconstructed, bring it back to your organizations and use it to start a conversation. For our listeners, you can find Lily's book at your favorite bookseller. 
For more information about Lily, please visit their website at www.lilyzeng.co. On behalf of Amanda and I, thank you for joining us. Lily, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and starting this really crucial conversation on how we can all make our organizations and workplaces better. Thanks again for joining us for Wind Down Wednesdays, a contemporary midweek discussion on current workplace and marketplace issues with a focus on diversity, inclusion, intersectionality, and equality. I'm Amanda Hammett, and on behalf of myself and Jeffrey Tobias Halter, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for joining us for Wind Down Wednesday. If you like this episode, please subscribe to receive more episodes straight to your inbox.